Story Ranger presents a book at bedtime. Celtic Tales as Told to the Children by Louis Chiselholm. And this is the story of the four white swans. In the days of long ago, there lived in the green isle of Erin, a race of brave men and fair women, the race of the Dedanans. North, south, east, and west did this noble people dwell, doing homage to many chiefs. But one blue morning after a great battle, the Dedanans met on a wide plain to choose a king. Let us, they said, have one king over all. Let us no longer have many rulers. Forth from among the princes rose five well-fitted to wield a scepter and to wear a crown, yet most royal stood both Derg and Lear. And forth did the five chiefs wander, that the Dedanan folk might freely say to whom they would most gladly do homage as king. Not far did they roam, for soon arose a great city. Both Derg is king, both Derg is king, and all were glad save Lear. But Lear was angry, and he left the plain where the Dedenan people were, taking leave of none, and doing Bogue Derv no reverence. For jealousy filled the heart of Lear. Then there were the Dedenans, then were the Dedenans wroth, and hundreds of swords were unsheathed and flashed in the sunlight on the plains. We go to slay Lear, who doeth not homage to our king, and regardeth not the choice of the people. But wise and generous was Bogue Derg. And he bade the warriors do not hurt to offend do no hurt to the offended prince. For long years did Lear di live in discontent, yielding obedience to none. But at length a great sorrow fell upon him, for his wife, who was dear unto him, died, and she had been ill but three days. Loudly did he lament her death, and heavy was his heart with sorrow. When tidings of Lear's grief reached Bovderg, he was surrounded by his mightiest chiefs. Go forth, he said, in fifty chariots go forth. Tell Lear I am his friend ever, and ask that he come with you hither. Three fair foster children are mine, and one may he yet have to wife. Will he but bow to the will of the people, who have chosen me their king? When these words were told to Lear, his heart was glad. Speedily he called to him his train, and in fifty chariots set forth. Nor did they slacken speed until they reached the palace of Bogderv. Bogderv by the great lake. And there at the still close of the day, as the setting rays of the sun fell athwart the silver web waters, did Lear do homage to Bogderg, and Bogderg kissed Lear and vowed to be his friend forever. And when it was known throughout the Dedenan host that peace reigned between these mighty chiefs, brave men and fair women and little children rejoiced, and nowhere were there happier hearts than in the green isle of Erin. Time passed, and Lear still dwelt with Bogue Derv in his palace by the great lake. One morning the king said, Full well thou knowest my three fair foster daughters, nor have I forgotten my promise that that one thou shouldst have a to wife. Choose her whom thou wilt. And Lear answered, All are indeed fair, and choice is hard, but give unto me the eldest, if it be that she be willing to wed. And Eve, the eldest of the fair maidens, was glad, and that day she was married to Lear, and after two weeks she left the palace by the great lake, and drove with her husband to her new home. Happily dwelt Lear's household, and merrily sped the months, then were born unto Lear twin babes, the girl they called Finola, and her brother they did name Aid. Yet another year passed, and again twins were born, but before the infant boys knew their mother, she died. So sorely did Lear grieve for his beautiful wife, that he would have died of sorrow, but for the great love he bore his motherless children. When the news of Eve's death reached the palace of Vovderg, by the great lake all mourned aloud for the love of Eve and sore pity for Lear and his four babes. And Bovderg said to his mighty chiefs, Great indeed is our grief, but in this dark hour shall Lear know our friendship. Ride forth, make known to him that Eva, my second fair foster child, shall in time become his wedded wife, and shall cherish his lone babes. So messengers rode forth to carry these tidings to Lear, 
And in time, Lear came again to the palace of Bove Derg by the Great Lake, and he married the beautiful Eva, and took her back with him to his little daughter, Finola, and to her three brothers, Aid, and Fircra, and Con. Four lovely and gentle children they were, and with tenderness did Eva care for the little ones who were their father's joy and the pride of the Dedanins. And as for Lear, so great was the love he bore them, that at early dawn he would rise, and pulling aside the deer skin that separated their sleep, his sleeping room with theirs, would fondle and frolic with the children until morning broke. And Bove Derg loved them well nigh as did Lear himself. Oftentimes he would come to see them, and oftentimes were they brought to his palace by the great lake. And through all the green isle were dealt the Dedanes people. There were also... There also was spread the fame of the beauty of the children of Lear. Chime crept on, and Finola was a maid of twelve summers. Then did a wicked jealousy find root in Eva's heart. And so did it grow, so that it strangled the love that she had borne her sister's children. In bitterness she cried, Lear careth not for me. To Finola and her brothers he hath given all his love. <laughs> And for weeks and months, Eva lay in bed, planning how she might do hurt to the children of Lear. At length, one midsummer morn, she ordered forth her chariot, that with the four children she might come to the palace of Bove Derg. When Finola heard it, her face grew pale, for in a dream it had been revealed unto her that Eva, her stepmother, should that day do a dark deed amongst those of her household. Therefore was Finola sore afraid, but only her large eyes and pale cheeks spake her woe, as she and her brothers drove with Eva and her train. On they drove, the boys laughing merrily, heedless alike of the black shadow resting on their stepmother's brow, and of the pale, trembling lips of their sister. As they reached a gloomy pass, Eva whispered to her attendants, Kill, I pray you, these children of Lear, for their father careth not for me, because of his great love for them. Kill them, and great wealth shall be yours. But the attendants answered in horror, We will not kill them. Fearful, O Eva, were the deed, and great is the evil that will befall thee, for having it in thine heart to do this thing. Then Eva, filled with rage, drew forth her sword to slay them with her own hand, but too weak for the monstrous deed, she sank back into the chariot. Onward they drove out of the gloomy pass into the bright sunlight of the white road. Daisies, with wide open eyes, looked up into the blue sky overhead, Gold glistened the buttercups among the shamrock. From the ditches peeped forget-me-nots. Honeysuckle scented the hedgerows. Around, above, and afar caroled the linnet, the lark, and the thrush. All was color and sunshine, scent and song, as the children of Lear drove onward to their doom. Not until they reached a still lake were the horses unyoked for rest. There Eva bade the children undress and go bathe in the waters. And when the children of Lear reached the water's edge, Eva was there behind them, holding in her hand a fairy wand. And with the wand she touched the shoulders of each, and lo, as she touched Finola, the maid was changed into a snow-white swan. And behold, as she touched Aid, Fiacra, and Con, the three brothers were as the maid. Four snow-white swans floated on the blue lake, and to them the wicked Eva chanted a song of doom. As she finished, the swans turned towards her, and Finola spake, Evil is the deed thy magic wand hath wrought, O Eva, on us the children of Lear, but greater evil shall befall thee, because of the hardness and jealousy of thine heart. And Finola's white swan breast heaved as she sang of their pitiless doom. The song ended, and again spake the swan maiden, Tell us, O Eva, when death shall set us free. And Eva made answer, Three hundred years shall your home be on the smooth waters of this lone lake. Three hundred years ye shall pass on the stormy waters of the sea betwixt Aaron and Alba, and three hundred years shall ye be tempest-tossed on the wild western sea, until Decca be queen of Largan, and the good saint come to Aaron, and ye hears the chime of the Christ bell, neither your plaints nor prayers, neither the love of your father Lear, nor of the might of your king, Bove Derg, shall have the power to deliver you from your doom. But lone white swans, though ye be, 
You shall keep forever your own sweet Gaelic speech, and ye shall sing with plaintive voices, songs so haunting that your music will bring peace to the souls of those who hear, and still beneath your snowy plumages shall beat the hearts of Fenola, Aid, Fiacra, and Con, and still forever shall ye be the children of Lear. And then did Eva order the horses to be yoked to the chariot, and away westward did she drive, and swimming on the lone lake were four white swans. When Eva reached the palace of Bove Durg alone, greatly was he troubled, lest evil had befallen the children of Lear. But the attendants, because of their great fear of Eva, dared not tell the king of the magic spell she had wrought by the way. Therefore Bove Durg asked, Wherefore, Eva, come not Fenola and her brothers to the palace this day? And Eva answered, Because, O king, Lear no longer trusteth thee, therefore he would not let the children come hither. But Bove Durg believed not his foster daughter, and that night he secretly sent messengers across the hill to the dwelling of Lear. When the messengers came there and told their errant, great was the grief of the father. And in the morning, with a heavy heart, he summoned a company of the Dedenans, and together they set out for the palace of Bove Durg. And it was not until sunset that they reached the lone show shore of Lake Darabra that they slackened speed. Lear alighted from his chariot and stood spellbound. What was that plaintive sound, the Gaelic words, his dear daughter's voice, more enchanting even than of old, and yet before around, only the lone blue lake, and yet before and around, only the lone blue lake. The haunting music ran clearer, and as the last words died away, four snow-white swans glided from between, from behind the sedges, and with a wild flap of wings flew towards the eastern shore. There, stricken in wonder, stood Lear. No, O Lear, said Fenola, that we are thy children, changed by the wicked magic of our stepmother into four white swans. And when we Lear and the Dedenan people heard these words, they wept aloud. Still spake the swan maiden, three hundred years must we float on this lone lake, three hundred years shall we be storm-tossed on the waters between Aaron and Alba, and three hundred years on the wild western sea. Not until Decca be queen of Largan, not until the good saint comes to Aaron and the chime of the Christ bell be heard in the land, not until then shall we be saved from our doom. Then great cries of sorrow went up from the Dedenans, and again Lear sobbed aloud, but the last silence fell upon his grief. And Fenola told him how her and her brothers would keep forever their own sweet Gaelic speech, how they would sing songs so haunting that their music might be, bring peace to the souls of all who heard. And she told also beneath, how beneath their snowy plumage the human hearts of Fenola, Aid, Fiacra, and Con should still beat, the hearts of the children of Lear. Stay with us tonight by the lone lake, she ended, and our music will steal to you across its moonlit waters and lull you into a peaceful slumber. Stay, stay with us. And Lear and his people stayed on the shore that night and until the morning glimmered, and then with the dim dawn, silence stole over the lake. Speedily did Lear rise, and in his haste did he bid farewell to his children that he might seek Eva and see her tremble before him. Swiftly did he drive and straight until he came to the palace of Bove Durg, and there by the waters of the great lake did Bove Durg meet with him. O Lear, wherefore have thy children come not hither? And Eva stood by the king. Stern and sad rang the answer of Lear, Alas, Eva, your foster child, hath by her wicked magic changed them into four snow-white swans. On the blue waters of Lake Darvra dwell Fenola and Aid and Fiacra and Con, and thence come I that I may avenge their doom. A silence as the silence of death fell upon the three. And all was still, save that Eva trembled greatly. But ere long, Bove Durg spake, fierce and angry did he look, as high above his foster daughter he held his magic wand. Awful was his voice as he pronounced her doom. Wretched woman, henceforth thou shalt no longer darken this fair earth, but as a demon of the air shalt thou dwell in misery till the end of time. And of a sudden, 
out from her shoulders grew black, shadowy wings, and with a piercing scream she swirled upward until the all-stricken Dedenes saw naught save a black speck vanish among the lowering clouds. And as a demon of the air do Eva's black wings swirl her through space to this day. But great and good was the bow of Durg. He laid aside his magic wand, and so spake, Let us, my people, leave the great lake, and let us pitch our tents on the shores of Lake Darvra. Exceeding dear unto us are the children of Lear and I. Both Durg and Lear their father have vowed henceforth to make our home forever by the lone waters where they dwell. When it was told throughout the Green Isle of Erin of the fates of the children of Lear, and of the vow that Bove Durg had vowed, from north and south, east and west, the Dedenans flocked to the lake, until a mighty host dwelt by its shores. And by day Finola and her brothers knew no loneliness, for the sweet Gaelic speech they told of their joys and their fears, and by night the mighty Dedenans knew no sorrowful memories, for by haunting songs were they lulled to sleep and the music brought peace to their souls. Slowly did the years go by, and upon the shoulders of both Durg and Lear fell the long white hair. Fearful grew the four swans, for the time was not far off, when they must wing their flight north to the wild sea of Moyle. And when the, at length the sad day dawned, Finola told her brothers how their three hundred happy years on Lake Davra were at an end, and how they must now leave its peace for evermore. Then slowly and sadly did the four swans glide to the margin of the lake. Never had the snowy whiteness of their plumage so dazzled the beholders, never had music so sweet and sorrowful floated to Lake Davra's sunlit shores. And as the swans reached the water's edge, silent were the three brothers, and alone Finola chanted her farewell song. With bowed heads did the Dedenan host listen to Finola's chant, and when the music ceased and only sobs broke the stillness, the four swans spread their wings, and, soaring high, paused but for one short moment to gaze upon the kneeling forms of Lear and Bovdurg, then, stretching their graceful necks towards the north, they winged their flight to the watery waters of the stormy sea that separates the blue Alba from the green iron island of Erin. And when it was known throughout the green isle that the four swans had flown, so great was the sorrow of the people that they made a law that no swan should be killed in Erin from that day forward. With hearts that burned with longing for their father and their friends did Finola and her brothers reach the Sea of Moyle. Cold and chill were its wintry waters, black and fearful with a steep rock overhanging. Alba's far-stretched coasts. From hunger, too, the swans suffered. Dark indeed was all, and darker yet as the children of Lear remembered the still peaceful waters of Lake Davra and the fond Adenin host on its peaceful shores. Here the sighting of the wind among the reeds no longer soothed their souls, but the roar of the breaking surf struck fresh terror in their sorrow. In misery and terror did the days pass, until one night the black, lowering clouds overhead told them that a great tempest was nigh. Then did Finola call to her aid, Finacra and Khan. Beloved brothers, a great fear is at my heart, for in the fury of the coming gale we may be driven from one another. Therefore let us say where we may hope to meet when the storm is spent. And aid answered, Wise thou art, dear gentle sister, if we be driven apart, may it be to meet again on the rocky isle that has oftentimes been our haven, for it is well known to us all, and from far it can be seen. Darker grew the night, louder raged the wind, as the four swans dived and rose again on the giant billows. Yet fiercer blew the gale, until the midnight loud bursts of thunder mingled with the roaring wind, but in the glare of the blue lightning's flashes the children of Lear beheld each the snowy forms of the other. The mad fury of the hurricane yet increased, and the force of it lifted one swan from its wild home on the billows and swept it through the blackness of the night. Another blue lightning flash, and each swan saw its loneliness and uttered a great cry of desolation. Tossed hither and thither by wind and by wave, the white birds were well nigh dead when the dawn broke, and with the dawn fell calm. 
Swift as her tired wings would bear her, Finola sailed to the rocky isle where she hoped to find her brothers, but alas, no sign of them there was. Then to the highest summit of the rocks she flew, north, south, east, and west did she look, yet naught she saw save a watery wilderness. Now did her heart fail her, and she sang the saddest song she had yet sung. As the last notes died, Finola raised her eyes, and lo, Con came slowly dr swimming towards her with drenched plumage and a head that drooped. And as she looked, behold, Fiacre appeared, but it was as though his strength failed. Then did Finola swim towards her fainting brother and lend him her aid, and soon the twins were safe on the sunlit rock, nestling for warmth beneath their sister's wings. Yet Finola's heart still beat with alarm as she sheltered her younger brothers, for aid came not, and she feared lest he were lost for ever. But at noon, sailing, he came over the breast of the blue waters, with head erect and plumage sunlit, and under the feathers of her breast did Finola draw him, for Con and Fiacra still cradled beneath her wings. Rest here while ye may, dear brothers, she said. She sang to them a lullaby so surpassing sweet that the seabirds hushed their cries and flocked to listen to the sad, slow music. And when Aid and Fiacra and Con were lulled to sleep, Finola's notes grew more and more faint and her head drooped, and soon she too slept peacefully in the warm sun. But few were the sunny days on the Sea of Moyle, and many were the tempests that ruffled its waters. Still keener grew the winter frost, and the misery of the four white swans was greater than ever before. Even their most sorrowful Gaelic songs told not half their woe. From the fury of the storm they still shot shelter, on that rocky isle where Finola had despaired of seeing her dear ones once more. Slowly passed the years of doom, until one midwinter a frost more keen than any known before this froze the sea into a floor of solid black ice. By night the swans crouched together on the rocky isle for warmth, but each morning they were frozen to the ground and could free themselves only with sore pain, for they left clinging to the ice-bound rocks the soft down of their breasts, the quills from their white wings, and the skin of their poor feet. And when the sun melted the ice-bound surface of the waters and the swans swam once more in the sea of moil, the salt water entered their wounds, and they well-nigh died of the pain. But in time, the down on their breasts and the feathers on their wings grew, and they were healed of their wounds. The years dragged on, and by day Finola and her brothers would fly towards the shores of the green Isle of Erin, or to the rocky blue headlands of Alba, or they would swim far out into the dim grey wilderness of water. But ever as night fell, it was their doom to return to the Sea of Moyle. One day, as they looked towards the green isle, they saw coming... To the coast a troop of horsemen mounted on snow-white steeds, and their armor glittered in the sun. A cry of joy went up from the children of Lear, for they had seen no human form since they spread their wings above Lake Darvra, and flew to the stormy sea of Moyle. Speak, said Finola to her brothers, speak, and see if these be not our own Dedenan folk. And Aid and Fiacre and Con strained their eyes, and Aid answered, It seemeth, dear sister, to me that it is indeed our own people. As the horsemen drew near and saw the four swans, each man shouted in the Gaelic tongue, Behold, the children of Lear! And when Finula and her brothers heard once more the sweet Gaelic speech and saw the faces of their own people, their happiness was greater than can be told. For longer, for long they were silent, but at last Finula spake. Of their life on the sea of Moyle she told, of the dreary rains and blustering winds, of the giant waves and the roaring thunder of the black frost, and of their own poor, battered, and wounded bodies. Of their loneliness of soul, of that she could not speak. But tell us, she went on, tell us of our father Lear. Lives he still in Bove Derg and all our dear Dedenin friends? Scarce could the Dedenin speak for the sorrow they had for Finola and her brothers. But they told how Lear and Bovderg were alive and well, and were now even celebrating the Feast of Age at the House of Lear. But for their longing for you, your father and friends would be happy indeed. Glad then and of great comfort were the hearts of Finola and her brothers, but they could hear no more, for they must hasten to fly from the pleasant shores of Erin to the sea stream of Moyle, which was their doom. And as they flew, Finola sang, 
and faint fluttered her voice over the kneeling host. As the song grew sadder and more faint, the Dedenans wept aloud. Then, as the snow-white birds faded from sight, the sorrowful company turned their heads of their white steeds from shore and rode southward to the home of Lear. And when it was told there of the sufferings of Finola and her brothers, great was the sorrow of the Dedenans. Yet was Lear glad his children were alive, and he thought of the day when the magic spell would be broken, and those so dear to him would be freed from their bitter woe. Once more were ended three hundred years of doom, and glad were the four swans to leave the cruel sea of Moyle. Yet might they fly only to the wild western sea, and tempest-tossed as before, here they in no way escaped the pitiless fury of wind and waves. Worse than aught they had endured before was a frost that drove the brothers to despair. Well nigh frozen to a rock, they one night cried aloud to Finola that they longed for death, and she too would fain have died. But that same night did a dream come to the swan maiden, and when she awoke she cried to her brothers to take heart. Believe, dear brothers, in the great God who hath created the earth with its fruits and its sea and its terrible wonders. Trust in him and he will yet save you. And the brothers answered, We will trust. And Finola also put her trust in God, and they all fell into a deep slumber. When the children of Lyra awoke, behold, the sun shone, and thereafter, until the three hundred years on the western sea were ended, neither wind nor rain nor frost did hurt the four swans. On a grassy isle they lived and sang their wondrous songs by day, and by night they nestled together on their soft couch, and awoke in the mornings to sunshine and to peace. And there on their grassy island was their home, until the three hundred years were at an end. Then Finola called to her brothers, and trembling she told, and tremblingly they heard, that they might now fly eastward to seek their old home. Lightly did they rise on their outstretched wings, and swiftly did they fly until they reached land. There they alighted and gazed at each other, but too great for speech was their joy. And then again did they spread their wings and fly above the green grass on and on till they reached the hills and trees that surrounded their old home. But alas, only the ruins of Lear's dwellings were left. Around was a wilderness overgrown with rank grass and nettles and weeds. Too downhearted to stir, the swans slept that night within the ruined walls of their old home. But when day broke, each could no longer bear the loneliness. And again they flew westward. And it was not until they came to Inisglora that they alighted. On a small lake in the heart of the island they made their home, and by their enchanting music they drew to its shores all the birds of the west, until the lake came to be known the lake of bird flocks. Slowly passed the years, but a great longing filled the hearts of the children of Lear. When would the good saint come to Erin? When would the chime of the Christ bell peal over the land and sea? One rosy dawn, the swans awoke among the rushes of the la lake of the bird flocks, and strange and faint were the sounds that floated to them from afar. Trembling, they nestled close to one another, until the brothers stretched their wings and fluttered hither and thither in great fear. Yet trembling, they flew back to their sister, who had remained silent among the sedges. Crouching by her side, they asked, What, dear sister, can be the strange, faint sound that steals across our land? With quiet, deep joy, Finola answered, Dear brothers, it is the chime of the Christ bell that ye hear, the Christ bell of which we have dreamed through thrice three hundred years. Soon the spell will be broken, soon our suffering will end. And then Finola did glide from the shelter of the sedges across the rose-lit lake, and there by the shore of the western sea she chanted a song of hope. Calm crept into the hearts of the brothers as Finola sang. And as she ended, once more the chime stole across the aisle. No longer did it strike heart, no longer did it strike terror into the hearts of the children of Lear. Rather, as a note of peace, did it sink into their souls. Then, when the last chime died, Finola said, Let us sing to the great king of heaven and earth. Far still the sweet strains of the white swans, far across in Esclora, until they reached the good Saint Kermach for whose early prayers the Christ, ch the Christ bell had chimed. And he, filled with wonder at the surpassing sweetness of the music, stood mute, 
But when it was revealed unto him that the voices he heard were the voices of Finola and Aid and Fiacra and Khan, who thanked the high God for the chime of the Christ bell, he knelt and also gave thanks. For it was to seek the children of Lear that the saint had come to Inisglora. In the glory of noon, Kemek re reached the shores of the little lake and saw four swans gliding on its waters. And no need had the saint to ask whether indeed these were the children of Lear. Rather did he give thanks to the high God who had brought him hither. Then gravely the good Kemek said to the swans, Come ye now to land and put your trust in me, for it is in this place that ye shall be freed from your enchantment. These words the four swans heard with great joy, and coming to the shore they placed themselves under the care of the saint. And he led them to his cell, and there they dwelt with him. And Kemek sent to Aaron for a skillful workman, and ordered that two slender chains of shining silver be made. Betwixt Finola and A did he clasp one silver chain, and with the other did he bind Fiacre and Khan. Then did the holy children then did the children of Lear dwell with the holy Kemek. And he taught them the wonderful story of Christ that he and St. Patrick had brought to the Green Isle. And the story so gladdened their hearts that the misery of their past sufferings was well nigh forgotten, and they lived in great happiness with the saint. Dear to him they were, dear as though they had been his own children. Thrice three hundred years had gone since Eva had chanted the fate of the children of Lear, until Decca be the queen of Largan, until the good saint comes to Aaron, and ye hear the chime of the Christ bell. Shall ye not be delivered from your doom? The good saint had indeed come, and the sweet chimes of the Christ bell had been heard, and the fair Decca was now queen of the King Largan. Soon were tidings brought to Decca of the swan maiden and her three swan brothers. Strange tales did she hear of their haunting songs. It was told her, too, of their cruel miseries. Then she begged her husband the king that he would go to Kemok and bring to her these human birds. But Largan did not wish to ask Kemok to part with the swans, and therefore he did not go. Then was Decca angry, and swore she would live no longer with Largan, until he brought the singing swans to the palace. And that same night she set out for her father's kingdom in the south. Nevertheless, Largan loved Decca, and was great was his grief when he heard that she had fled, and he commanded messengers to go after her, saying he would send for the white swans if she would but come back. Therefore Decca returned to the palace, and Largan sent to Kemak to beg of him the four white swans. But the messengers returned without the birds. Then was Largan wroth, and set out himself for the cell of Kermak. But found the saint, he found the saint in a little church, and before the altar were the four white swans. Is it truly told to me that you refers these, refuse these birds to Queen Decca? asked the king. It is truly told, replied Kemek. Then Largan was more wroth than before, and seizing the silver chain of Finola and Aid in one hand, and the chain of Fiacre and Khan in the other, he dragged the birds from the altar and down the aisle, and it seemed as though he would leave the church. And in great fear did the saint follow. But lo, as they reached the door, the snow-white feathers of the four swans fell to the ground, and the children of Lear were delivered from their doom. For was not Decca the bride of Lergan, and the good saint, had he not come, and the chime of the Christ bell, was it not heard in the land? But aged and feeble were the children of Lear. Wrinkled were their once fair faces, and bent were their little white bodies. At the slight, Lergan, affrighted, fled from the church, and the good Kemet cried aloud, Woe to thee, O king! Then did the children of Lear turn towards the saint, and thus Finola spake, Baptize us now, we pray thee, for death is nigh. Heavy with sorrow are our hearts, that we must part from thee thus, thou holy one, and that in loneliness must thy days on earth be spent, but such is the will of the high God. Let Here let our graves be digged, and here bury our four bodies, Khan standing at my right side, Fiacre at my left, and aid before my face, for thus did I shelter my dear brothers for thrice three hundred years neath wing and breast. Then did the good Kemek baptize the children of Lear, and therefore the saint looked after. And thereafter the saint looked up, and lo, he saw a vision of four lovely children with silvery wings and faces radiant as the sun. And as he gazed, they floated ever upwards until they were lost in the mist of blue. Then was the good Kemek glad, for he knew they had gone to heaven. But when he looked downward, four worn bodies lay at the church door, and Kemek wept sore. 
And the saint ordered that a wide grave be digged close by the little church. And there were the children of Lear buried, Con standing at Finola's right hand, and Fiacra at her left, and before her face her twin brother Aid. And the grass grew green above them, and a white tombstone bore their names, and across the grave floated morning and evening the chime of the sweet Christ bell. We are going to read a Japanese fairy tale from a collection of fairy tales that was compiled by Yai Theodora Ozaki. And this is the story of the man who did not wish to die. Long, long, long ago, there lived a man called Sentaro. His surname meant millionaire, but although he was not so rich as all that, he was still very far removed from being poor. He had inherited a small fortune from his father and lived on this, spending his time carelessly, without any serious thoughts of work, till he was about thirty-two years of age. One day, without any reason whatsoever, the thought of death and sickness came to him. The idea of falling ill or dying made him feel very wretched. I should like to live, he said to himself, till I am five or six hundred years old at least, free from all sickness. The ordinary span of a man's life is very short. He wondered whether it were possible, by simply living and by living simply and frugally henceforth, to prolong his life as long as he wished. He knew there were many stories in ancient history of emperors who had lived a thousand years, and there was the princess of Yamoto, who, it was said, lived to the age of five hundred. That was the latest story of a very long life record. Sentaro had often heard tales of the Chinese king named Shinoshiko. He was one of the most able and powerful rulers in Chinese history. He built all the large palaces and also the famous Great Wall of China. He had everything in the world he could wish for, but in spite of all of his happiness and the luxury and the splendor of his court, the wisdom of the, his counselors and the glory of his reign, he was miserable because he knew that one day he must die and leave it all. When Shinoshiko went to bed at night, when he rose in the morning as he went through his day, the thought of death was always with him. He could not get away from it. Ah, if only he could find the elixir of life, he would be happy. The emperor at last called a meeting of his courtiers and asked them all if they could not find for him the elixir of life, of which he had so often read and heard. One old courtier, Jofuku by name, said that far away across the seas there was a country called Horizon, and that the certain hermits who lived there possessed the secret of the elixir of life. Whoever drank of this wonderful draught lived forever. So the emperor ordered Jofuku to set out for the land of Horizon to find the hermits and to bring him back a vial of the magic elixir. He gave Jofuku one of his best junks, fitted it out for him, and loaded it with great quantities of treasures and precious stones for Jofuku to take as presents to the hermits. Jofuku sailed to the land of Horizon, but he never returned to the waiting emperor. But ever since that time, Mount Fuji has said to be has been said to be the fabled Horizon and the home of the hermits who have had the secret of the elixir, and Jofuku has been worshipped as their patron god. So now Sentaro determined to set out to find the hermits, and if he could, to become one, so that he might obtain the water of perpetual life. He remembered that as a child he had been told that not only did these hermits live on Mount Fuji, but that they were said to inhabit all the very high peaks. So as he left his old home to the care of his relatives and started out on his quest, he traveled through all the mountainous regions of the land, climbing to the tops of the highest peaks, but never a hermit did he find. At last, after wandering into an unknown region for many days, he met a hunter. Can you tell me, asked Sentaro, where the hermit lives, who has the elixir of life? No said the hunter. I can't tell you where such hermits live, but there is a notorious robber living in these parts. It is said that he is the chief of a band of two hundred followers. This odd answer irritated Sentaro very much, and he thought how foolish it was to waste more time in looking for the hermits in this way. So he decided to go at once to the shrine of Jofuku, which who is worshipped as the patron god of the hermits in the south of Japan. Sentaro reached the shrine and prayed for seven days, entreating Jofuku to show him the way to a hermit who could give him what he wanted so much to find. 
At midnight of the seventh day, as Sentaro knelt in the temple, the door of the innermost shrine flew open, and Jofuku appeared in a luminous cloud and calling to Sentaro to come nearer spoke, Your desire is a very selfish one and cannot be easily granted. You think that you would like to become a hermit so as to find the elixir of life? Do you know how hard a hermit's life is? A hermit is only allowed to eat fruits and berries and the bark of pine trees. A hermit must cut himself off from the world so that his heart may become as pure as gold and free from every earthly desire. Gradually, after following these strict rules, the hermit ceases to fear, to feel hunger or cold or heat, and his body becomes so light he can ride on a cane or a carp, and can walk on water without getting his feet wet. You, Sentaro, are fond of good living and of every comfort. You are not even like an ordinary man, for you are exceptionally idle and more sensitive to heat and cold than most people. You would never be able to go barefoot or to wear only one thin dress in the winter time. Do you think that you have the patience or the endurance to live a hermit's life? In answer to your prayer, however, I will help you in another way. I will send you to the country of perpetual life, where death never comes, where the people live forever. Saying this, Jofuku put in Sentaro's hand a little crane made of paper, telling him to sit on its back and it would carry him there. Sentaro obeyed wonderingly. The crane grew large enough for him to ride on it with comfort. It then spread its wings, rose high in the air, and flew away over the mountains right out to sea. Sentaro was at first quite frightened, but by degrees he grew accustomed to the swift flight through the air. On and on they went for thousands of miles. The bird never stopped for rest or for food, but it was as a paper bird. But as it was a paper bird, it doubtless did not require any nourishment. And strange to say, neither did Sentaro. After several days, they reached an island. The crane flew some distance inland and then alighted. As soon as Sentaro got down from the bird's back, the crane folded it up of its own accord and flew into his pocket. Now Sentaro began to look about him wonderingly curious to see what the country of perpetual life was like. He walked first round the country and then through the town. Everything was, of course, quite strange and different from his own land, but both the land and the people seemed prosperous, so he decided that it would be good for him to stay there, and he took up lodgings at one of the hotels. The proprietor was a kind man, and when Centaur told him that he was a stranger and had come to live with them, he promised to arrange everything that was necessary with the governor of the city concerning Sentaro's sojourn there. He even found a house for his guest, and in this way Sentaro obtained his great wish and became a resident in the country of perpetual life. Within the memory of all the islanders, no man had ever died there, and sickness was an unknown thing. Priests had come over from India and China and told them of a beautiful country called Paradise, where happiness and bliss and contentment fill all men's hearts, but its gates could only be reached by dying. This tradition was handed down for ages, from generation to generation, but none knew exactly what death was, except that it led to paradise. Quite unlike Sentaro and all the other ordinary people, instead of having a great dread of death, they all, both rich and poor, longed for it as something good and desirable. They were all tired of their long, long lives and longed to go to the happy land of contentment called paradise, of which the priests had told them centuries ago. All this Sentaro soon found out by talking to the islanders. He found himself, according to his ideas, in the land of topsy-turvydom. Everything was upside down. He had wished to escape from dying. He had come to the land of perpetual life with a great relief and joy, only to find the inhabitants themselves, doomed never to die, would consider it bliss to find death. What he had hitherto considered poison, these people ate as good food, and all the things to which he had been accustomed to as food they rejected. Whenever any merchants from other countries arrived, the rich people rushed to them, eager to buy the poisons. These they swallowed eagerly, hoping for death to come so that they might go to paradise. But what were deadly poisons in other lands were without effect in this strange place, and the people who swallowed them with the hope of dying only found that in a short time they felt better in health instead of worse. Vainly, they tried to imagine what death could be like. The wealthy would have given all their money and all their goods if they could but shorten their lives for two or three hundred years even. Without any change to live on, forever seemed to this people wearisome and sad. 
In the chemist shops, there was a drug which was in constant demand because after using it for a hundred years, it was supposed to turn the hair slightly grey to bring about disorders of the stomach. Sontaro was astonished to find that the poison globe fish that was served up in restaurants <clears throat> Sontaro was astonished to find that the poison globefish was served up in restaurants as a delectable dish, and hawkers in the streets went about selling sauces made of Spanish flies. He never saw anyone ill after eating these horrible things, nor did he ever see anyone without so much as a cold. Sontaro was delighted. He said to himself that he would never grow tired of living, and that he considered it profane to wish for death. He was the only happy man on the island. For his part, he wished to live thousands of years and to enjoy life. He set himself up in business and for the present never even dreamed of going back to his native land. As years went by, however, things did not go as smoothly as at first. He had heavy losses in business and several times some affairs went wrong with his neighbors. This caused him great annoyance. Time passed by the flight, like the flight of an arrow for him. For he was busy from morning till night. Three hundred years went by in this monotonous way, and then at last he began to grow tired of life in this country. And he longed to see his own land and his old home. However long he lived here, life would always be the same. So was it not foolish and wearisome to stay on forever? Sentaro, in his wish to escape from the country of perpetual life, recollected Jofuku, who had helped him before he went Sentaro, in his wish to escape from the country of perpetual life, recollected Jofuku, who had helped him before when he was wishing to escape from death, and he prayed to the saint to bring him back to his own land again. No sooner did he pray than the paper crane popped out of his pocket. Sentaro was amazed to see that it had remained undamaged after all these years. Once more the bird grew and grew till it was large enough for him to mount it, and as he did so the bird spread its wings and flew swiftly out across the sea in the direction of Japan. Such was the willfulness of the man's nature that he looked back and regretted all that he had left behind. He tried to stop the bird in vain. The crane held on in its way for thousands of miles across the ocean. Then a storm came, and the wonderful papal crane got damp and crumpled up and fell into the sea. Suntaro felt with it, very much frightened at the thought of being drowned. He cried out loudly to Jofuku to save him. He looked round, but there was no ship in sight. He swallowed a quantity of seawater, which only increased his miserable plight. When he was thus struggling to keep himself afloat, he saw a monstrous shark swimming towards him. And as it came nearer, it opened its huge mouth, ready to devour him. Sontaro was all but paralyzed with fear now that he felt his end so near, and screamed as loudly as he could to Jofuku to come and rescue him. Lo and behold, Sontaro was awakened by his own screams to find that his long prayer, that during his long prayer he had fallen asleep before the shrine, that all his ext extraordinary and frightful adventures had only been a wild dream. He was in cold perspiration with fright and utterly bewildered. Suddenly a bright light came towards him, and in the light stood a messenger. The messenger held a book in his hands and spoke to Sentaro. I am sent to you by Jofuku, who in answer to your prayer has permitted you in a dream to see the land of perpetual life. But you grew weary of living there, and begged to be allowed to return to your native lands so that you might die. Jofuku, so that he might try you, allowed you to drop into the sea, and then sent a shark to swallow you up. Your desire for death was not real. For even in that moment, you cried out loudly and shouted for help. It is also in vain for you to wish to become a hermit or to find the elixir of life. These things are not for such as you. Your life is not austere enough. It is best for you to go back to your paternal home and to live a good and industrious life. Never neglect to keep the anniversaries of your ancestors and make it your duty to provide for your children's future. Thus will you live to a good old age and be happy but give up the vain desire to escape death, for no man can do that. And by this time you have surely found out that even when the selfish desires are granted, they do not bring happiness. In this book I give you, there are many precepts good for you to know, and if you study them, you will be guided in the way I have pointed out to you. The angel disappeared as soon as he had finished speaking, and Sontaro took the lesson to heart. With the book in his hand, he returned to his old home, giving up all his old vain wishes, tried to live a good and useful life, 
and to observe the lessons taught to him in the book, and he and his house prospered henceforth. You have been listening to A Book at Bedtime, a Story Ranger Presents production. Tonight we read from Celtic Tales Told to the Children, the story of the Four White Swans, and from Japanese Fairy Tales, the story of the man who did not wish to die. Uh, links to support the channel can be found on youtube.com slash storyranger and on uh, Twitter at storyranger. If you have any ideas for stories you'd like to hear on the show, you can contact me uh, at those places as well. Thank you so much.